Bobby Morris, I am so excited to have you here. You know, of all the interviews that I've had, when it talks about, we talk about history of going back to the music industry, what you have done, and now being here in Vegas, yeah. you are like an encyclopedia. If there was ever the, the massive internet research of information that we needed, it comes all down to you, Bobby. It's amazing Thank you. Thank what you. you've done. This is incredible. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Tell me where it began for you. Where did, where did, how did music enter your life? Okay, I was, uh, I was born in this country. I was born in Poland. In Poland, yeah. Okay, I came over here uh, June 27, 1937, three days before my 10th birthday. <laughs> okay, and uh, I couldn't speak English. I spoke a lot of other languages as all the kids do in Europe. In Europe, yeah. My grandfather was, uh, was a military drummer. He was in, in a marching band. So he would take me along with him to watch him play you with his marching band. So they would, you know, the marching beats and all that type of stuff, you know. So when I came um, to the United States, uh, there was a community center that was giving, a, there was a drum teacher there. And this was where? What, what city was In it? Brooklyn. You came to Brooklyn. In <laughs> Great. Coney Island. Yeah. <laughs> the heart of it so, all, yeah. Unfortunately, I mean, if I happen to speak with a little bit of a Brooklyn accent, excuse me, okay? <laughs> Anyhow, I, I took some lessons, and uh, it, um, it was fine, but, but uh, I got very enthused, you know, about playing. So one day, I'm about 11 or 12 years old, <clears throat> I, I, I uh, see an ad about Benny Goodman coming to the Paramount Theater <clears throat> with Gene Krupa on drums. The biggest act that was out there. At the right. Time. Yeah. So I, I, I saved up, I saved up my pennies. You know, <laughs> you know how much it was to to see the whole show. How much? Twenty five cents. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about a lot of years ago. <laughs> so uh, anyhow, he uh, here comes the Benny Goodman band out of you know, out of the cellar, you know, and on, and then all of a sudden here comes another uh, thing with Gene Krupa's stand on it. You <laughs> know? Exciting. And uh, and they start playing the theme song, you know, and I'm absolutely thrilled. Then he plays Sing Sing Sing. I says, oh my God, and he did a drum solo, you know, <laughs> sing, sing, sing. I never heard anything like that in my life. It doesn't get any bigger than oh, this. Oh, it's the wonderful. It was sing, 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 sing. Wonderful. <laughs> At the end of the show, I'm walking down Broadway, and I'm passing by a world of some music store, and I hear this drummer playing, and, and I, he was playing wonderful. I said, where did you learn to play like that? He says, well, I have a teacher called Henry Adler. He said, the Whitby Hotel on 43rd and 8th Avenue. So I said, well, <laughs> I got to go see him. So I went down to see Henry and uh, he said, Mr. Adler, I'd like to take lessons from you. I, I heard one of your students, he's wonderful. So he said, well, okay, it'll be uh, $3 a lesson, you know, for a half hour. I said, okay, I'll just have to save my nickels and dimes, you know, <laughs> and do a little more shoe shining, you know. <laughs> So I, I started studying with Henry on a drum pad. And uh, th this went on for about six months. And he, uh, he said, Bobby, in one of my lessons, I want you to come and hear this kid, you know. Now he's been studying with me for over a year. I says, okay, what's his name? Freddie Gruber, <laughs> okay. So anyhow, Freddie is playing like the paradiddle, you know, like a maniac. <laughs> I said, my God, how do you do that? He says, well, you got to practice. So I started practicing. I was practicing three, four hours a day on the drum pad. Beautiful. So now I decided to practice five, five and six hours a day. <laughs> so I finally almost caught up to Freddie. And we, we started getting together and working out together and doing, you know, rudiments. And, uh, and it was wonderful. We, I've known him for my whole life, practically. Yeah. So from that point on, I, uh, I just kept practicing, working very, very hard, practicing. And at about 13 or 14 years old, I joined the Musicians Union. The inspector, you might say, that was uh, giving us, you know, checking us all out, uh, was a drummer. So he said, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do this kid in, you know. <laughs> I'm gonna so I'm going to really like doing. <laughs> so, okay, all right, play me a 
triple uh, Rademacher, okay? Now, how about a drag flamadiddle? <laughs> how about a double drag flamadiddle, you know? <laughs> so he, he goes, play me 13-stroke roll and, you know, whatever. So he goes through the whole routine, and I'm playing it all. Fortunately, thanks to Henry Adler, I, I had my rudiments down. Yeah. So I, uh, I went to the Musicians' Union, and I, um, I got my card, Local 802. 802, New yeah, York Union. Local 802, <laughs> yes. Local 802. <laughs> That's man. right. So I started hanging around, and now I'm about 14. I got my reading chops up real good. I'm reading everything. I mean, I, and I got my hands real good, but I really don't know how to play drums. <laughs> <laughs> so you're working mostly on a practice pad, not really on a drum set. I was practicing on a drum pad <laughs> for about two or three years. Somebody offered me a job at the Golden Hotel. I'm 14. Paid $15 a week in room and board. But I didn't have drums. So <clears throat> he, uh, I asked my father, I said, look, I've got a job. It's 10 weeks. It pays $15 a week. And I, I need a set of drums. But I found a set of drums at $150 with the cymbals and everything. He says, well, I'll, I'll lend you the money, but you got to promise to pay me back at the end of the 10 weeks. I says, I give you my word. <laughs> so at the end of 10 weeks, I paid them back, but I learned a lot during that first summer because I was playing for shows. Yeah. Now, I didn't know the, the drum thing or hi-hat cymbals, so I went to a friend of mine, Sonny, the drummer with the Freddie Slack band. He was a neighbor. I said, Sonny, how do you play a hi-hat beat? <laughs> he said, Shh, sh, 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 sh. I said, oh, thank you very much. So that hi-hat beat <laughs> took me through the, the summer. I, <laughs> I, I was able to play the shows because now I knew with the hi-hat beat, you know. <laughs> Henry did, didn't ever tell me that it required a hi-hat beat <laughs> to play drums, you know. I did the uh, summer, and I gave my father back to $150. Which is what you made, $15 <clears throat> I made $15 a week, a week but it was, <laughs> it was the Catskill Mountains. You make, like, you know, the three meals a day. They give you everything. So I didn't need to spend anything. I brought a toothbrush and toothpaste, so that lasted me for the summer, oh, and I was set. So I gave my father back the money, and, um, and uh, now I own a set of drums. So the next year, I got a job making $25 a week at the Catskill Mountains, and now I was able to keep it, you know. And I played for all the acts that were coming up there, and it was a wonderful experience. And, and the Catskill Mountains, just so people understand, this was a performance. They had all different acts that came in, and singing acts, and dancing acts. Oh, yeah. Oh, there were stars. Everything. I mean, yeah. there was a lot of uh, name people yeah, at the time. Yeah. And we had a, you know, I was with a five-piece band, and they gave me the music to read, and we uh, rehearsed it down, and that was it. Mm. So at the end of the summer, I, I had $250 now because <laughs> I, I made $25 a week. So that, that was wonderful. And uh, I uh, finally got a job at the Neville Country Club with a Latin band because I used to hang around the Havana Madrid in New York. And I played with Chino Pozo, Chano Pozo, uh, Tino, Tito Puente. We would... One would play timbales, the other would play blangos and congas, you know. Anyhow, I really got with Latin. But uh, Eddie, um, Henry Adler showed me Latin music. Mm -hmm. But this was like, I, w I was really into it. I loved it. So I would always go down to the Havana Madrid in New York and sit in. In back of the uh, Havana Madrid, they would have sessions. So one would play like time. And like one ding 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 ding, you know, playing the the uh, timbali thing and congas with timbom go goom ba goom ba goom ba ba, you know, <laughs> to go through the whole routine, you know, and it was wonderful. So I I uh, I started playing with with some Latin bands, but anyhow, I came up Neverly Neverly Country Club with a Latin band, the Cameo, mm. and then the main room was Art uh, Khan and with the American band, but we played the Latin band. So I, I stayed there for about a, a year or so. So this is, uh, this is really on-the-job training. Yes. Uh, and you were still studying with Henry Adler at the time. I was studying with Henry, right. and also I was studying with Terry Snyder at the Perry Como show. Right. Because I, I love vibraphones. 
So I, I wanted to, you know, play full that kind percussion. of a melodic instrument. Yeah. That, well, that was very smart of you to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I learned, and he sold me a set of vibes. Uh, <clears throat> Deegan Imperial. It was a beautiful set of vibes. Mm. <clears throat> and I would go every week, take a lesson from Terry Snyder. And I would take my lesson from Henry Adler, too. But there's a funny, funny story, <laughs> Dom. If I, sure. if I, I finally got a job playing. A man called me, Kenny Sheldon, a trumpet player in New York. He said, I'd like you to come down, and, uh, but you have to bring the drums and the vibes. I said, man, that's a lot of stuff to bring, you know. <laughs> so anyhow, but I figured, well, it'll give me an experience and I'll be able to play vibes. Finally, I could play vibes for somebody. <laughs> so I came down and, um, and I hired a cab, a yellow cab. And they put the vibes in the middle of the cab, you know, the drums on top of, <laughs> of the vibes. And we, came, and we went down to Queens. The place was three stories down, Dom. So I, I dragged the, the, you know, snare case, you know how, how heavy a trap how case is. that must with have been. With all the hardware. So I take that one at a time. I go all the way down and I take the vibes and I go one step, one step at a time. I'm dragging the vibes down. <laughs> And I have finally I have it all set up. Okay, we get ready to play, and I'm playing the drums, you know, with the band. But I'm waiting for him to come to say, to him, "Come up and play vibes." But he started playing vibes. He 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 hired me because I had vibes. Oh, that's hysterical. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, so he started. He wanted to play vibes, so I never got a chance to play the vibes. <laughs> so anyhow, the job ended. The job ended, the trumpet player packs a trumpet, a saxophone player, a piano player close to the lid on the piano, and here I am and it's dark. Okay, so I, I, I'm, I'm dragging the, the, the drums up one step at a time, <laughs> then I drag the Imperial Deegan vibe. It was like a monster set, it was a beautiful set, but it, it was a studio set, you know. So I'm dragging that up, and um, I get up to the top and it's raining. So I finally hailed the cab, and I, I got the cab, and he took me back to Brooklyn, you know, with the, with the uh, vibes in the middle, you know, and the drums on top of that. And, and uh, finally I got upstairs. Guess how much the job paid, how much the cab ride was? $7.50 round trip. Guess how much the job paid? $7.50. <laughs> I made seven dollars fifty cents because I thought I would have a chance to play vibes, you know. <laughs> so anyhow, that was the, that was the end of that. I I then started hanging around the Fifty uh, Second Street, which at that time music was everywhere, right? Yes, there was, there was incredible amount of yes. clubs, yes. And great players playing, right? Yes, and you see in my. In, in my lessons, in my uh, knowledge of, of drumming, you know, I, I, I became very friendly with Jim Chapin. Yeah. And, and I would go over to his house, you know, and take some lessons from Morningside him. Morningside Drive. That's He's right. Really, really, I knew Jim very well. <laughs> Jim was one of my Drive. teachers, absolutely. <laughs> right. I studied with Jim for many years. Yeah. Oh, yeah? yeah? So, well, you'd appreciate this story. So, finally, I, I got that. Uh, that book, you know, Independence, Quarter Independence. Jim Chapin, Advanced Techniques for the Modern Drummer. That's yes. right, Advanced <laughs> Techniques. So I go over the whole book, you know, with Jim. And we're, you, we're having fun, you know, like it was just a wonderful time. It got to a point where he, he challenged me. He says, Bobby, I'll bet, I'll bet you can't do this. I said, what? I said, let's play the book, the uh, Independence book, from first page to the last without stopping. I says, okay. <laughs> so anyhow, to make a long story short, we did it. I did it, okay? I kept up with Jim. Amazing. And he's amazing. I mean, you know, Jim, well, you studied yeah, with Jim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyhow, so I got, I got a 52nd Street and started playing with uh, different uh, uh, jazz people. So you're getting, you're getting all this experience. You're playing with different jazz people. Yes. You're still taking lessons with people. It's yes. amazing how you you still pursued learning. Yes. While you were playing, getting the Absolutely. experience. Absolutely. Yes. So, I I worked Fifty Second Street with Don Bias, Ben Webster. You probably know some Absolutely, people. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Big drummer was Sid Catlett. You Absolutely. Know? And uh, Ben Webster, Coleman Hawkins. It was a wonderful little group. Great musicians. And, yeah. yeah. And we were playing some nice things. Anyhow. We hear a story. We hear a story that uh, there's a new music 
going on in Harlem, and it's called bebop. <laughs> I said, oh, my God, and, and they're going to be coming into the Dolby Club on the street, you know. I said, well, who's in the band? I'm talking to Kay Winding. Kay was with the Stan Kenton band, but he was playing jazz, you know, with years, us. Many years, yeah. So uh, Kay said, well, <clears throat> on trumpet, there's Dizzy Gillespie, on saxophone, Charlie Parker, on uh, trombone, J.J. Johnson, on bass, Curly Russell, <laughs> piano is uh, Bud Powell, and, <laughs> and Max Roach. <laughs> <laughs> Max, I also took a few lessons with. That is an incredible band to hear. <laughs> Max Stroke. So, so we all go over to see the opening. This is like a big, big happening, you know. So J.J. Uh, Johnson opens the first tune, just the trombone thing, eight-bar thing. It's a modern... You know, they go into that tempo. Yeah. Kay Winding is, says, I'm leaving. I says, where are you going? He says, I'm going to go. I'm going to go on 52nd Street. I'm going to put the trombone on the street. I'm going to let a cab driver run over it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, this is a freak. I said, I can't, you know. So anyhow, that was the beginning. And the happening of the bebop era. It was yeah. an amazing time. Well, you caught that right at the birth of yeah. it. Yeah, I, I was right there. I was and Charlie right. Parker, how did Charlie play? How was his intensity when he played? Charlie played, Charlie was unbelievable. Yeah. And you know, every every note that Charlie played on alto saxophone, J.J. Johnson was playing on trombone. Incredible. And they were like, it was unbelievable. It was real tight and organized. Um, and so any, I got to know Max very well and and you know, I went over his house. Roy, Roy Haynes would come down. I, yeah. Roy Haynes moved to Las Vegas, and we, I, he invited me over to his house. We, we played together quite nice. a bit. Nice. So I played on 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 that that situation. Okay, I was making fifty dollars a week. It wasn't paying very much jazz, but a friend of mine, Tony Rongo, is with the Sammy K band. Okay, now I'm into swing and sway uh, with Sammy. Swing K. and sway, <laughs> so, Tony Rango. Yeah. He says, "Bobby, I'm leaving." You know, he was a neighbor. Sonny and um, and Tony were very close neighbors in Brooklyn to me. So I'm a kid, you know, and I I'm asking questions, and I'm always over the house, you know, asking questions, practicing whatever. And Tony says, "Bobby, listen, I'm going to leave. You know, I'm leaving." But he's going to be auditioning drummers, and it'll be about 25 drummers. But you, you come in and sit on my stand and just listen to what I do, play exactly what I do, no more, no less, okay? And I, I want you to wear a nice suit, you know, and tie. I don't have a suit. He says, I'll give you a suit. Don't worry <laughs> about it. So he, he lent me a suit and a shirt and tie, comb your hair nice, comb my hair. I would go over and listen to the band, you know, uh, sitting on Tony's uh, thing. So anyhow, uh, I went to audition, and, and these drummers are auditioning, and they're, they're all trying to, all the technique, you know, and all over the place, like, you know, they're going to, like, be heroes, you know. <laughs> so I come on, and they're, you know, Sammy K. Yeah. Very simple. Very like uh, crisp and all that. Yeah. Anyhow, I got the job, and it it paid two hundred and fifty dollars a week. Amazing. We're at the Edison Hotel. I'm making fifty dollars on on, <laughs> on the street. So, but I'm still playing on the street after the Edison because we finished the Edison about like eight o'clock or so. You know, we uh, do a, a radio broadcast. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, direct from the Hotel Edison in. New York City, we bring you Swing and Sway with Sammy K. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, I'm, I'm doing this, and it's wonderful. I'm playing like the jazz thing at night. I'm playing with Sam, making money. You know, I got an $8 a week uh, uh, room, you know. You're making 300 a week doing both gigs. <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, You're really Oh, um, wow. unbelievable, wow. unbelievable. So he, we go on tour. And, and it's about 50 cities, maybe 300 towns, I don't know. We're one town, every town that had 5,000 people, we're, we're playing for. Sure. 
So th this this went on, and I'm in Detroit, and I'm sitting with the uh, with the band manager George. I said, George, it's ten below zero. There must be a place on Earth that that has nice weather. I said, what what can, what can you recommend? <laughs> he said, Well, there's a little town out in the west called Las Vegas. He says uh, it's a small town. There's five hotels, uh, twenty six thousand people all together between. There's a Boulder City and Henderson and North Las Vegas and Las Vegas. It's 26,000 people all together. So when we, we came back from the tour, and uh, I'm in Charlie's Tavern. You know Charlie's Tavern, yeah. Dom. You, yeah, absolutely. You, you're, you're the man. Absolutely. You, so uh, <laughs> I'm hanging out at Charlie's Tavern with Sir Chaloff, Zoot Sims, uh, um, uh, you know, all the... Everyone hung out there, yeah. Uh, yeah. All the Absolutely. jazz, uh, Stan Getz. Yeah. I mean, just, you know, everybody. And uh, so we'd hang out, you know, and the guy comes in, says, I'm looking for a drummer to come to Las Vegas. His name is Garwood Van. So I said, I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care about the money. Nothing. I'll go. You, know, you heard I, Las I just, Vegas. Yeah, yes. I just heard Las Vegas. <laughs> So we come out to Las Vegas. This is 1950 now. This is 1950, right? 1950. It was October 1950. But but we went out. He uh, he uh, he wanted to pick up a Los Angeles uh, band to come to Vegas, but he wanted me to play drums, guard with that. So I, w I was very fortunate because I was able to get my local 47 card and my 369 card at the same time. Nice. So I went out to Las Vegas with the Garwood Van, and, and we opened up at the last frontier, Dom. And um, so it's, uh, the first act was Liberace. Okay, now Huge. we're playing for Liberace, and he's practicing, you know, and uh, between sets and all that, not making very much money. I mean, uh, he's the star of the show, but they weren't making a lot of money because we weren't making a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think we were making $87 a week, Incredible. scale. But I took it because I wanted to get out of, you know, and, and make a different life for myself. Yeah. We finished the engagement with Liberace, and Liberace says, Bobby, I would like you to come and, and do a television show with me in Los Angeles. I said, well, what does it pay, Lee? He said, well, it pays $43. I says, well, Lee, I'm making $87. I can't leave an $87 here for $43. He says, but it'll get better, Bobby. It'll get better. <laughs> so he went out to Los Angeles. The Riviera was just finished be being built. The show went network, his show, and he became a big, big star. Absolutely. So nobody made this kind of money, but he came in as the star making $50,000 a week. Incredible. He came back a few other times later on making 300000 a week. So anyhow, there's a big party for him at the, on, on the 10th floor at the suite at the uh, Riviera Hotel. And he, um, I'm invited up, and uh, I see Lee. I go over to him. I says, wow, amazing what happened. He says, you should have come with me, Bobby. I told you to get better. <laughs> I told you to get better. So anyhow, we... Um, I, I remained there, and in the, in the lounge comes Gene Krupa. Uh, Bobby Scott, I think, was playing piano. I mean, it's a wonderful group. And uh, we would come in and hear Gene every night. And Mary Kay Trio was alternating with him. It's a whole... So anyhow, every, every time I pass, uh, uh, Gene said, oh, you, you, you're the drummer in the... Big one? I said, yeah, Bobby Moore. He says, sit in, man, sit in. So I, I would sit in, you know, every time I passed by, I'd say, sit in. <laughs> I said, he would, he liked to mingle and he was yeah. kind of tired. <laughs> so he said, sit in, you know. So anyhow, I finally said, Gene, look, they're paying to see you, not me. So you, please go and play. I want to <laughs> I want to hear you play too, you know. <laughs> so this went on and, and a little bit later on, a um, an actor came in as the star of the show. I called him Ronnie. And uh, he came in with two girls, three girls, you know, and he did a little soft shoe. He did some jokes. He did, a, you know, some comedy, some talk, whatever. And he came in, and he and I became friends. And he, he, he says, Bobby, he says, 
I, I told him, I'm sorry, I said, uh, Ronnie, listen, there's a place uh, called the Silver Slipper to have wonderful breakfast. How about we go have breakfast? Ham and eggs, you know, and all that uh, ham, egg, tomato, toast, coffee, whatever, 49 nice. cents. <laughs> so, so he says, great. So the next day he says, Bobby, I want to take you, okay? So this went on for a month. This went on for a month. Anyhow, to make a long story short, Ronnie turned out to be Ronald Reagan, okay? <laughs> I know this is very hard for people to, to, uh, to absorb. That's the way it was. Absolutely. He was a B-movie actor. Yeah. He was not a governor then. Yeah. He was not a president. He was just Ronnie, you know.